Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In about 14 minutes, the sponsor of this program, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, will have something important to say to homeowners, a message which over the past eight weeks has led thousands of Americans to request more information about the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. So, Mrs. Housewife, if your husband is not listening to this program, better send one of the children to fetch him. Tell him he's going to hear about America's finest plan for home ownership. A plan that can save you money. Tonight's FBI file, The Surplus Swindle. Upon whom should rest the greater weight of guilt for illicit operations? The criminal operator himself? Or the professing good citizen with his double code of ethics who denounces the criminal on Main Street and trades with him in the alley? Tonight's case from the files of your FBI was inspired by this hypocrisy of the professing good citizen who underwrites illicit commerce. In a Chicago apartment hotel overlooking Lake Michigan, an attractive young woman dressed to go out for the evening is pacing the floor in a fit of ill temper. Presently, the cause of her ill temper inserts a key in the door. Trudy! Trudy, my dear. I'm right here. Uh, oh. Uh, hello, darling. I said hello. I heard you. Uh, Trudy, darling, you look lovely. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. In fact, you're simply... Where have you been? Uh, how's that, my love? You were taking me for cocktails at 6, dinner at 7, and the theater at 8.30. It's now five minutes after 9. I've had nothing to drink, nothing to eat, and the curtain's been up for 35 minutes. I can explain everything. To tell you the truth, my dear... You're lying. Trudy. Who won the fourth race? Lightning by... I knew it. That was very unfair of you. How much did you blow? Uh, what's that? How much did you lose at the races? <clears throat> uh, have we any bourbon left, my dear? Answer me. Well, uh, quite a bit. How much? Everything. What? Uh, just treat it lightly, my dear. I have a plan whereby we can recoup... You lost $10,000? Fate, my dear. Kismet. Oh. oh, I have frightful luck. 
Even the horses I was afraid of were running out of the money. I knew this had happened. Now, Trudy, I... spent three months on the swindle that got us that 10000 and you drop it in one afternoon. Darling, you must be philosophical. Easy come, easy go. Easy go is right. You get out of here. I, uh... What? I said get out. And don't come back till you got that 10000 Trudy, darling. I'm warning you, if you don't get that money, I'll turn evidence for the government in that Oklahoma swindle and put you out of circulation. Now beat it. Where will I sleep? Just get that dough. If you don't, you can sleep in pinstripe pajamas. Earlier that evening in the Chicago office of the FBI, an assistant to the agent in charge was sitting at his desk when... Mr. Adams? Yes? I'm Special Agent Roan of the Indianapolis office. Oh, come in. Uh, thanks. <laughs> what brings you over here? Uh, you, you remember that general bulletin all field officers got from Washington about a week ago about that Oklahoma swindle? Oh, sure. The man who posed as a government land agent and sold some drilling rights. Yeah, that's it. John Fremont was the name he used. You got something new on it? Fremont is in this area somewhere now. How do you know? Police checked on a car this afternoon that was parked in an Indianapolis garage four days ago. Had an Oklahoma license. It belonged to John Fremont? That's right. Well, I guess that calls for a little teamwork on our part. Yeah, I've, I've started to check on Indianapolis hotels. But the garage manager believes he overheard Fremont say he was taking a train over here to Chicago. Uh, I understand there was a girl mixed up with him. She worked with him. Yeah. Well, she wasn't in the car when he drove it into the garage. Well, they're probably still together anyway. Well, that's probable. I'll notify the police department right away, and we'll start combing the city ourselves. It'll be like looking for a couple of needles in a haystack. Well, we found smaller needles in larger haystacks, and I have a hunch that a couple of needles like Fremont and that girl are pretty likely to stick somebody around here. And we'll hear the yell. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Who is it? Package for Mrs. Fremont. Oh. Greetings, my dear. What do you want? I've already announced that. I have a package for Mrs. Fremont. You see? Is there any money in that bundle? A potential fortune, my sweet. I mean cash. Well, uh, truthfully, no. Then I can't use it. Uh, Trudy, please. Get out of here. Not until I'm allowed to plead my case. Now, let me in. You keep ah, out. Ah, 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 ah. Ah. That's better. Look, I'm telling you right now, any con that you pitch at me is just a waste of time. My dear girl, I'm here to present the opportunity of a lifetime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just open this first package. What's in there, old mutual tickets? Don't be bitter. Now, go ahead and open it. Okay, do I eat it, wear it, or throw it at you? You wear it. And on you, my dear, it should look ravishing. Oh, brother. That's it. Now, uh, take away the tissue... What the... A uniform. A whack uniform, darling. Look, what's the gag? I'm making you a, a member of the armed forces. Now, wait a minute. A lieutenant in the service of your country. In fact, my personal aide. Huh? Uh, this is my uniform here. Who are you, MacArthur? No, uh, just a colonel. Look, colonel, I don't know what this is all about, and I hate to disillusion you, but the war is over. Granted, my dear. But there is still an army, and there is still larceny. I intend to capitalize on both. Here we go again. This is my most colossal creation. I don't want to hear it, Colonel Fremont. From now on, my dear, a nom de plume. Colonel Edmonds. Edmund Schmedmonds, I ain't playing. Kindly wait until you hear my plan of attack. No! You are undoubtedly aware there is a shortage in the consumer market of many items of which the army has an abundance of... I'm sorry, miss, but we're all out of that album. Try us again next week. And now, uh, what can I do for you, miss? Uh, I mean, Lieutenant. I'd like to get Duke Ellington's latest album, please. Oh, surely. It's right here. Oh, there we are. Anything else? No, that's all. That'll be $2.92. Okay. 
Here you are, five dollars. Thank you. Two ninety-two, three dollars for five. Oh, by the way, what can you do for me in the way of a radio? Well, I'm afraid I can only take your order. I can't promise when you'll get delivery. Oh, it's that bad, is it? Yes, and no telling when it'll get better. I see. Perhaps I can do something for you. I beg your pardon? Would you like to buy some radios? Would I? I could sell all I could get my hands on. Why? Well... I'm stationed at Chicago Signal Depot, and the colonel I work for, Colonel Edmonds, he's in charge of selling the Army surplus radio sets. Oh? Are you interested? I should say so. But I couldn't compete with the bigger dealers on quantity. You could if you didn't have to go through regular channels. Oh. You still interested? You bet I am. How many sets could you handle? What kind are they? Suitable for a table model, and they're the best, I can guarantee that. What price? $25. I could arrange for you to get 200 of them. That's $5,000. That's right. Too much for you? Well, no. Naturally, the colonel could transact no business with you at the post, you understand? Of course not. And this would be an all-cash deal. You'd be making it on your own responsibility. I understand. Look, Colonel Edmonds will be registered at the Hotel Jerome tomorrow noon. What's your name? Trenton. Have the money with you. Okay. I'll be there. Well, how's the needle in the haystack hunt coming along, Mr. Adams? Well, it's rather slow business, Roan. Well, that's an advantage we have in Indianapolis. There are not so many hotels to check. <laughs> And, of course, if Fremont or the girl happens to have an apartment here, that makes the hunt even harder. Well, wherever they are, hotel or apartment, I'm sure they're using other names. Yeah. We've alerted detectives in all major department stores. Oh, in case the girl spends some of the Oklahoma money that way, huh? That's right. And we've alerted all the banks in case Fremont tries raising money the hot check way. Good. All we can do for the present is finish the hotel check, which will take a few more hours. And if that doesn't turn them up? I still believe they're bound to try another swindle. Sit down. Uh, sit down, Mr. Trenton. Uh, thank you, Colonel. Will you have a cigar? A spot of port? Uh, no, thanks. How soon can I get delivery on the radios, Colonel? Just as soon as you care to pick them up, sir. You mean it's up to me? My dear fellow, in a transaction of this kind, you could hardly expect me to have United States Army trucks deliver them. Oh, oh of course, I didn't think of that. Uh, take down this name and address. All right, just wait till I get my pencil. There we are. General Warehouse, Clark and Division Streets. Are uh, the radio stored there? Uh, yes, and you contacted Mr. Randolph. I see. I'll telephone him and order him to release 200 sets to you. Uh, good. And now, if you don't mind, I have a couple of other appointments. I, uh, oh, uh, yes, I believe you know the terms. Yes, I have the money with me. 5,000, wasn't it? Uh, yes, yes, that is correct. Here you are, Colonel Edmonds. Well, uh, thank you, sir. And you may rest assured I'll say nothing about this. Yes? Excuse me, Colonel, but didn't I understand the young lady, the lieutenant, to say that you were stationed at Chicago Signal Depot? That is correct, sir. I had a son there during the war. Bully for him. The Chicago Signal Depot is Signal Corps. That's right. And you're attached to the Signal Corps? Indeed I am. It's been my honor to serve with that branch for 15 years. That's funny. Uh, uh what do you mean? That collar insignia you're wearing is artillery. Oh, well, I, uh, I, uh, sort of double between the two. What? Well, you know how things are in the army. Uh, when we run short of arms, we, uh, use signals. You what? Yes, that's the fortunes of war, Mr. Trenton. Now, this sounds pretty fishy to yeah, me. Now, just a minute, sir. No insults to the uniform, please. I think you're a phony. I should have suspected something about this setup before. But I was so anxious to get the radio... I've had enough, Mr. Trenton. So have I. I want my money back right now. Now, look here, I said sir. I want my money back or I'm picking up that telephone and I'm going to... Not so fast, sucker. Huh? Oh, the phony whack. Get away from that phone. Oh, no, I'm going to... Thanks for diverting his attention, Trudy. Just hand over that money, stupid. This calls for a quick retreat.
And now, before the FBI file on the surplus swindle resumes, as it will in just a moment, here's that important message for homeowners and home buyers. For eight weeks, I've been telling you about America's finest plan for home ownership. But next week, the Equitable Society will have a new and different message. So it's very important for you to listen carefully tonight to get firmly in mind how to finance the mortgage on your home for maximum safety, protection, and economy. Remember, the largest single investment the average man makes in his life is in his home. After careful comparison with other plans, over 80,000 American families in 900 communities have chosen the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan because it combines these five important advantages. One, the mortgage is canceled, paid off in full if owner dies. And besides, every dollar previously paid on principal is returned in full to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. Two, a special cash fund is built up, ready to be used if financial emergencies threaten the home. Three, this cash fund increases as the mortgage shrinks. It can be used to shorten the term of the mortgage. Pay off a 20-year mortgage, for example, in as little as 14 years, saving six years' interest. Four, mortgage interest not at 6%, not at 5%, but at only 4%. Five, liberal allowance to cover title search, lawyers' fees, and other closing costs. No broker's commission or bonus charges. Well, frankly, there is no other plan like this anywhere. The Equitable Society calls it America's finest plan for home ownership. It protects you against the two major hazards of home mortgages, death and hard times. So if you're planning to buy or build a house, or if you now own a home, get complete information on the Assured Home Ownership Plan from your Equitable Society representative. That's the Equitable Society. E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, The Surplus Swindle. The professing good citizen who deliberately enters into an illicit transaction is not entitled to too much sympathy if he comes off with the worst of the bargain. And nine times out of ten, he does if the transaction is an attempted swindle. For swindlers live by stacking the cards against their potential victims. Some 30 minutes after the bogus army colonel had struck him down and fled with his money, the man called Trenton regained consciousness and made his way to the Chicago office of the FBI, where he has just finished giving a brief account of what happened. Well, that's about all I can tell you, Mr. Adams. I don't think it is, Mr. Trenton. What do you mean? You've left out some details that would put you in a bad light, haven't you? I beg your pardon. The girl posing as a whack... She more than likely told you the deal for the radio sets would be an off-the-record transaction, didn't she? Well, she... You've been in business long enough to know it was irregular. I'm as much entitled to those radios as anybody else. Oh, you thought you were getting a bargain at the taxpayer's expense? They offered to sell me 200 radio sets and I... And now that it's turned out to be an out-and-out -out swindle and you've got a lump on your head and lost your $5,000, you suddenly realize it was not right to deal with people like that. Well, you're surely not going to let them get away with it. We're not going to let them get away with it because they've broken the law. That's all I ask of you. But as for you, Mr. Trenton, I hope you learned a lesson from this. Well, that's a strange attitude. What about your attitude? Your attitude toward your moral obligations as a citizen. Look here, Mr. Adams. You call yourself an honest citizen, I'm sure. Well, certainly. Yet you deliberately conspired in what you thought was a deal that would have robbed your own government out of 200 radio sets and $5,000 and put at least twice that much in your own pocket. I still say... No, Mr. Trenton, I haven't much sympathy for you. Rome. Yeah. The descriptions Mr. Trenton gave us, check them with those of Fremont and the girl we're after. Right. And we'd better alert all radio dealers right away in case they try the same stunt. Okay. Mr. Trenton, 
When we catch these people, we let you know. Will I get my money back? If they haven't spent it. Good day, sir. Sailing, sailing over the bounding main. Good afternoon, Trudy. Where have you been? I just took a stroll downtown. I thought we were supposed to stay undercover. This was a business mission. You know, the cops have got to be looking for us, Bob. I am aware of that. What have you got in those packages? Something for our next job? There ain't going to be any next job. Not in this town. We've got time for one more score, my dear. Now, let's take advantage of it. Oh, no. We're getting out of here today. Here's one package for you and one for me. Wait a minute. More uniforms? That's right. Open it up, my dear. I should say not. Why? No more costumes. You couldn't have done any worse than that last job if you'd been dressed as a Nazi spy. We got the money, didn't we? And this will get us more. Ensign, salute your lieutenant commander. Oh, no. Yeah, come on, we'll get to work right today. I won't do it. I've got a scheme figured out this time that's absolutely foolproof. I'm not listening. Now, here are your sailing orders. That must be the sucker now. Well, let him in, my dear. Okay. How do you do, ma'am? I'll come right in, Mr. Clay. Thank you. Commander Edmonds, this is Mr. Clay, the used car dealer I contacted this morning. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Well, how do you do, Mr. Clay? How do you do, Commander? Uh, Have a chair, sir. Thank you. I uh, understand, Mr. Clay... You're interested in purchasing some of these surplus cars we have on hand? Yes, if I can get immediate delivery. Well, my dear fellow, you can go for them at once. They're in the government carpool right here in the city. Good. Uh, How many are you prepared to purchase? I understand they've never been driven. Just as good as the day they rolled off the line. I want ten of them. You, uh... Ten. Uh, You, uh, uh... You understand the terms, of course. Uh, $500 each. Uh, that is correct. I have the money with me, 5000 cash. Uh, good. Then take this address. I know where the carpool is located. Uh, very well. You will contact the Lieutenant Mason. I shall telephone him meanwhile and order him to release ten cars of your own choosing. Their apartment is located at the end of the hall, Mr. Adams. At least you came off better, Mr. Clay, than their last victim. He got a lump on his head. I guess I deserve one myself. Uh, You have the key the manager gave you, Ron? Yeah. When did you discover you had been swindled, Mr. Clay? When I went to the carpool a while ago. I just left here two hours ago. That's given them a pretty good start. Here's the apartment. Open it up, Ron. Right. Go ahead. Thanks. They sure lost no time getting out. Look at the mess. But they couldn't have gotten very far. It's like I said, Mr. Clay, two hours is a good start. Yes, but... Uh, Let's take a look around and see if we can pick up any clues, Ron. Right. Uh, Can I help you with anything, gentlemen? Uh, No, thanks. Anything in those papers in the desk drawer? Nothing that means anything. Looks like they've cleaned out everything that might have given us a lead. I better call the office and get agents checking on train, bus, and airline terminals. Hello, operator. Uh, Get me central... Wait a minute. Not now, thank you. What's the matter, Mr. Adams? I just noticed something that might be something. What's that? Where? Look at this scratch pad here by the phone. Uh, What about it? There's an impression of something that was written on a sheet of paper that was torn off. Hmm. Can you read it? Yes. 902C. You think that might be something? It's bound to be, or it wouldn't be written there. Could it be an apartment number, maybe? Uh, it could be, but... 902C. I... What in the world could that stand for? 902C. Wait a minute. Got an idea? Yes. This pad is right by the phone. 
Let's check the switchboard operator. See if she has a record of Fremont's calls. How'd you make out? I have a list of all the outgoing calls Fremont made in the last two days. Good. We can check it over right here in the lobby. How many calls are there? About a dozen. Let's take six apiece and go to work. Mr. Adams? Yeah? How are you coming along? I've checked three of them so far. No luck. Well, I've finished my list. They were all to bookmakers. You take one of these numbers here. I'll finish up on the other two. Roan. Roan. Yeah? I think I've found what we're looking for. Really? Yes, get the office on the phone. Tell them we're leaving town on the first plane. Where are we? This is Atlanta, darling. We'd taken a plane, like I told you. We'd already be in Miami. I couldn't get space, my dear. You're just afraid to fly. Oh, oh, oh nonsense. <laughs> what time do we get to Miami? We'll be there bright and early in the morning. You'll just be there early. Uh, what? Skip it. Trudy, my love. Yeah? I've already developed a plan for making our vacation hours profitable. You better have if you want any spending money. I'm holding on to this 10000 It's all yours, my sweet. You bet you're ever loving... What's the idea? Probably the conductor wants to check our tickets. Yes? Mr. Fremont? Uh, you must have the wrong compartment. I think not. This is car 902, compartment C, isn't it? Say, what is this? We're special agents of the FBI, miss. Uh, what? You're and what? thanks for jotting down your space number on your telephone pad, Fremont, or this might have taken us a little longer. I don't know what you're talking about. Just come along with us. I think we can arrange for you to wear a government uniform that you've missed. John Fremont and his wife both received long sentences in the federal penitentiary for their two swindles. It is healthier for the American public every time a pair of criminals like John Fremont and his wife are safely placed behind penitentiary walls. But it is no help in trying to stop the increasing crime wave if some of you allow yourselves to be swindled. Again, the FBI asks you not to do any business with any stranger who approaches with a proposition whereby you will become wealthy without doing any work. Such a proposition bears the mark of a swindle, with you as the victim. So every time you're asked to make an investment, check up on it first. And when you have learned that lesson and learned it well, the swindlers will come to their deserving fate. Next week, another thrilling case from the files of your FBI. We'll tell you about it in just a moment, but now... Let me refresh your memory on the more important features of the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. Remember that the mortgage interest is only 4%. Remember that if the owner dies, the widow owns the home without any mortgage at all. Yes, the Assured Home Ownership Plan is practically foreclosure-proof. To get the full story, talk to the Equitable Society representative in your community. Ask him for literature that gives all details. You'll find his name in your local phone book under the name Equitable, E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Sinister Shakedown.
incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Sinister Shakedown on this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you one of the 50 million Americans covered by Social Security? If so... Have you any clear idea of your rights and benefits under Social Security? Well, there may be a pleasant surprise in store for you. For in a few minutes, you'll learn from our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, how easy it is to build Social Security into full security. Tonight's FBI file, The Sinister Shakedown. All crimes are crimes of passion. For all crimes are committed for the gratification of some overwhelming selfish desire whether it be for profit, for revenge, for excitement, or for preservation against some threat of injury to pride, prejudice, or person. But not always is the person who commits a crime for one of these motives a criminal in the social sense of the word. Rather, as in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, he may be an otherwise wholly acceptable member of society who, in the face of some personal crisis, lacks the moral stamina to resolve it honorably and instead seeks a way out criminally. The business operations of the late industrialist Thomas J. Cortland had never engaged the interest of his family, except that they fully appreciated the financial security and the firm hold on a place in metropolitan society which... Portland's labors afforded them. But at this moment, three years after his death, something has happened which demands a belated interest in Cortland's transactions. Mrs. Cortland, his widow, has summoned her children, Beverly and Perry, to join her in the breakfast room. Beverly is first to enter. Oh, good morning, Mother. I'm afraid, my dear, it's anything but a good morning. Oh. Well, you look as if you've seen a corpse on the living room rug. Well, that would scarcely be more serious than what has happened. Mm, what is it? Well, we'll wait for Perry. <sighs> what on earth's the matter? You sit down, dear, and have your orange juice. Okay. Oh, good morning, all. Good morning, <clears throat> Perry. Oh, brother, dear, you look awful. Well, that's just how I feel. Oh, my head. <laughs> Has anybody got We a... have something more important than your head to worry about, Perry. Huh? At this very moment, our family is threatened with utter disgrace. What do you mean? It's blackmail, of course, sheer blackmail. And, blackmail. and I'm sure there's not a word of truth in it. Why, I just I can't believe that your father would have committed such a thing. Father. Oh, what on earth are you talking about? This letter, it just came this morning. You read it, Perry. 
Okay, if I can see it. Uh, what did you say? <clears throat> uh, dear Mrs. Cortland, I have in my possession a document which would positively prove that your late husband, just before he died, was party to a transaction which netted him $500,000 that rightfully should have gone to his stockholders. I don't believe it. And unless you pay me 5000 at once, according to the instructions below, I shall place the document in the hands of the New York State Authority. Oh. Let me warn you, if you report this to the police, someone in your family may turn up missing. Well, what do you think of that? Oh. Mother, what do we do? Well, I, uh, I don't know. What do you think, Perry? Well, whether it's true or not, I, I don't think we can afford to take any chances. Well, what do you mean? In a time like this, we've got to look at it practically, and well, frankly, we're not sure that Dad didn't do it. Perry! Maybe he was in a jam, and... I had to do something like that to protect us. Oh, yes, but I don't... And if he did, gee, we can't afford to turn this letter over to the police. Oh, that... That might start an investigation of your father's business dealings. Sure. Look, if we pay the $500,000, how, how do we know that that'll be the last it's of it? It's better than to take a chance on that than, rather than risk an investigation. Oh, well, what do you think, Mother? Well, I, I... I say for the sake of all of us, and for the sake of Dad's name, too, we, we ought to pay off. But I don't like the idea of being blackmailed. Neither do I. And what are we going to do? Well, I'm... I'm going to think about it a little more before I do anything. Come in. private detective? That's right, Miss Cortland. But how did you know who I am? Well, let's see now. In this morning's picture in the paper, you were sitting behind bottles and glasses at the Mercury Club. Two mornings ago, it was a shot at the vet's hospital. That was yesterday. Well, then it must have been the one with you at the dog show. Yes. I liked them all. They're a good-looking kid. Thanks. Mr. Roberts... I know, I know. You didn't come here to invite me to your charity ball next week. Maybe you'd, uh, you'd better close that door. Oh. Now, come on over and sit down. Thank you. Well, I hope it's you who's in trouble, Miss Cortland, because I'd love to get you out of trouble. Maybe I've made a mistake in coming to you. Okay. There's a door. Oh, wait. What I mean is... I've read in the papers about some of the cases you've worked on, but I... Uh... You mean, have I ever worked for people like you before? Well... And I... you want references to prove it. Well, I would like to know... Would you like for me to give you for a reference sometime? Of course not. Okay. Remember, you came to me. I didn't send for you. I know. But you must promise me one I thing. I don't promise anything but good service. I insist that absolutely nothing must get into the papers about this. Now, look, Miss Cortland. The cheap cases get me all the publicity I need to get the society cases that pay me enough not to have to talk about them. Very well, then. Yeah. Now, what is it, a blackmail letter? How did you know there was a letter? Well, it nearly jumped out of your bag when you went for a cigarette a minute ago. Oh. It is a blackmail letter. But I I've got to return it before Mother knows I took it. Okay, then. We're losing time. Give me the story. A few hours later, in the office of John Ames, an assistant to the agent in charge of the New York office of the FBI. I want to assure you, Mrs. Cortland, you've done the only proper thing in reporting this matter to the FBI. But you understand why I hesitated. My son and daughter don't know yet that I've taken this course. But they were opposed to it? Oh, well, only because of the risk of... of an investigation in the business affairs of my late husband. Oh? Well, you can see that it would be disastrous for us if there's any truth in it. But... Well, I'd, I'd rather it should be known than to have it on my conscience that I was paying a blackmailer to suppress it. Well, I'd like to say, if I may, Mrs. Cortland, I admire your courage and your moral sense of responsibility. Well, it's, it's the only right way for me to look at it. Oh, yes, of course. But as for the risk of an investigation, whether there would be any valid ground for it or not, all the Bureau can be concerned with in this case is the threat of kidnapping. Oh? 
Yes, you see, Mrs. Corbin, only an officer or a stockholder in your late husband's firm or some civil authority could institute such an investigation. But, well, what of the person who wrote the letter? Well, you surely don't think the would-be extortioner is an officer or a stockholder? Oh, no, no, of course not. But, well, he, he claims to have documentary evidence. Well, it remains to be seen whether there is such a document. And if there is? What would you want to do about it? Well, I'd... I'd want to make everything right, of course. Well, then we have only one thing to worry about. Catching the writer of that letter. Now, then, uh, what do you wish me to do? Well, nothing for the moment. Just leave the letter with us for examination. Yes? And we'll get in touch with you the minute that it is necessary. But uh, what shall I tell them? Your son and your daughter? Yes. Just tell them that it's now in the hands of the FBI. Hello, Ralph. Here you are, driver. Is my brother in the club, Ralph? I haven't seen him this evening, Miss Cortland. Well, if he comes, don't tell him I'm here. Very well. Good evening, Miss Cortland. Why did you have me meet you here, Mr. Roberts? Well, the meeting was your idea. But the 7-Eleven Club was your idea. Well, I thought you'd be more at home in a nightclub. Why did you have to pick this one? Well, I had to come over here anyway. What's wrong with it? This is my brother's favorite hangout. Oh, yes, that's right. I've read that in the columns. And I certainly don't want him to see me talking to now, you. Now, please sit down. Your brother should happen in and see us. You don't have to scream out that I'm a private detective, do you? I'm sorry. Do uh, you have a gold key here, too? What do you mean? I mean, a key that lets you into the, uh, the gambling room. Oh, oh, no, why? Well, I thought since your brother has... One... I didn't meet you to talk about my brother. Okay. What are you drinking? Nothing. If you came to talk about the case, I haven't got anything to report yet. That's all right, but we've got to work faster than ever now. Why? Mother turned it over to the FBI today. That's where it belonged in the first place. How did they get hold of that document about my father? I don't believe there is any documents. But what if there is? I'm working for you. I'd have to turn it over to you if I got it. Then please, you've got to get it. <laughs> okay. I'd better be going now. Oh, when will I see you again? Come to my office tomorrow at 3 o'clock. Why 3 o'clock? Because I think I'll have had an appointment just before then with the extortioner. <laughs> Come in, Mrs. Cortland. Thank you. I came as soon as I could, Mr. Ames. Have you found out something? Well, we examined the extortion letter first for fingerprints. Oh, but so so many of us handled the letter. But yes. As we found no prints which we could identify with those of any known criminal. I see. But on checking the watermark of the paper itself, yes. we were able to trace it to the store in the city which handled it exclusively. Rainers. Rainers? Yes, and we were able to get a list of the customers who purchased that particular paper. Oh, Here's the list. Mm -hmm. Now, do you recognize the names of any of them? Well, well, good heavens, there's my name. Then you do use this kind of paper? Oh, well, yes, it, it looks very much like it, but... Oh, I, uh, I'm sure it's only coincidence. Oh, but of course, I, I, I have my monogram. Well, you must get some of it plain, say, for second pages. Yes, but heavens, Mr. Ames, you're not implying that... Oh, I, I repeat, it could only be coincidence. Well, I guess that will be all for now, and thanks very much for coming in. We'll call you if anything further develops. Oh, yes. Yes, all right. Well, this way, please, Mrs. Gordon. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Monroe? Monroe? Yes, Mr. Ames? Did you hear my conversation with Mrs. Cortland? Yes. Well, I think we'd better start checking on the Cortland servants and on the private lives of her son and daughter, too. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Cortland. How did you know me? The business I'm in. You're, uh, Lou Roberts? That's right. Look, 
I don't know what this is all about. Well, that's why I asked you to come here. Sit down. I'm afraid I haven't got time. I haven't got much either. Well, then get to the point. Well, I'll start with the singer at the 7-Eleven Club. What about her? She's worried about you, Cortland. She's what? She's worried about the spot you're in. <laughs> what are you talking about? Oh, the 2500 bucks you owe the house and gambling losses. So what about it? They gave you a week to get it up. Right? Well, did they appoint you to collect? Nope. Then what's your angle in it? My angle is that you picked a risky way to raise the dough. What? But of course you're asking for 5000 what? what do you mean by that? The extortion letter you wrote your mother. Look here, Roberts. Are you trying to... Well? How do you know about any extortion letter? Why? Who hired you? Client. My sister, I'll bet. I just said it was a client. Uh-huh. Well, what makes you think I wrote that letter? Because a Welcher will do anything to get up the dough when the heat's on him. And if I told the FBI the heat's on you, they could put two and two together just like I did. But you're not going to tell them. Oh, I'm not if you come clean. You're not even going to tell my sister that you suspect me. You're not going to tell anybody anything. Gordon, put down the gun. Oh, right. oh, yep. oh, oh. return in just a moment to tonight's case, which shows how your FBI helps provide national security. And now let's listen in on a conversation about social security between a man named Fred Boyd and his friend, the Equitable Society representative. I don't get it. You're a life insurance man, yet you say social security is a swell thing. Doesn't social security sort of take the place of life insurance? No, Fred. We Equitable Society representatives look on social security and life insurance as a team. They both pull together. What do you mean? Well, for the first time, the man of average salary has a chance to retire on an income that will enable him to enjoy a good standard of living. Social security will give him part of the income he needs. And life insurance can provide the rest. The two of them dovetail together perfectly. Say, that's a new angle. You start with Social Security as the foundation and then build on top of that, huh? Yes, many Americans have never discovered how easy it is to build Social Security into full security through life insurance. Most people are amazed when they discover how little it costs. For instance, if you already own some life insurance, your Equitable Society man may be able to show you how only a few dollars extra per month will give your wife complete protection and assure you a comfortable retirement income through the Equitable Extended Income Plan. Remember, your Social Security benefits vary according to your age, salary, and family situation. So why not get the facts? Find out exactly what you're entitled to under Social Security. The government has prepared a special card that will help you secure this information. To obtain one of these cards, Get in touch with your Equitable Society representative or send your name and address on a postcard to the Equitable Society care of the station. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file... The Sinister Shakedown. Someone once said that the trouble with lying is you have to keep telling other lies to cover up the previous one. And pretty soon you're trapped in your own web of deceit. Likewise, the person who commits a crime and then commits another in an effort to conceal the first is only weaving another strand in the net that must inevitably close in upon him. It was not more than 15 minutes after Perry Cortland had shot down the private detective Lou Roberts and fled from the office that Beverly Cortland started up the same flight of stairs to keep her appointment with Robert.
operator. Get me the FBI. <laughs> Naturally, Miss Cortland, we're wondering how you happened to come here to Mr. Roberts' office. Oh, it was about the extortion letter. Before Mother turned it over to you, I... I secretly hired Mr. Roberts to work on the case. Oh, I see. I realized it was the wrong thing to do, Well, but... I think I understand why. Thank you. And when you arrived this time and found the body... I started to leave, but... I thought I'd better come back and call you. Why? If somebody had seen me come here, I... I might have been suspected of having something to do with it if I ran away. But why did you call the FBI, not the police? I guess because the FBI was on my mind anyway in connection with the letter. You think there might be some connection between the letter and Robert's killing? How would I know? Hmm. And all? Yes? Did you find anything? Well, according to his files, the, the only case Roberts was working on at this time was the Cortland case. All the others seem to be closed. Well, that makes it look like there's some connection anyway. Yeah. Well, Miss Cortland. Yes? How far had Mr. Roberts gotten with this case? Well, all I know is he told me to come here at 3 o'clock this afternoon because he... Yes? Uh, because he thought he might have some news. I see. And Roy, you better call the police. Right. The police? But do I have to... I think they'll permit us to follow through on this, Miss Cortland, since there might be a connection with the threatening letter. Oh. Now, you drive on home if you will. Tell your mother to meet me at our office in an hour. Yes. Yes, all right. Thank you very much. What are you thinking, Mr. Ames? Well, I'm thinking that Miss Cortland got here a little too late for a real shock. How's that? I'm afraid Roberts beat us to it in finding out about Perry Cortland's gambling debt at the 7-Eleven Club. Cartland? Look, uh, I told you I got the money for you, didn't I? I just wanted to remind you, your time is up tomorrow night. All right, all, all right, I'll have it by then. Just be sure you do. Okay, stop worrying, will you? I'm not the one that's worrying. So long, Cartland. <laughs> Come right in, please, Mrs. Cortland. Oh, I'm so glad to see you, Mr. Ames. Oh, what's the trouble? This, a second letter. When did you receive this? This afternoon, special delivery. Here. Thank you. Gives you one more chance to pay. Mm. And whoever it is knows the FBI is working on it. Yes, I see his warning about calling us off. It's rather foolish of him to admit knowing that we are on the case, since so few know it. Well, what do you mean? We have good reason to believe that this is the work of someone in your own household. Oh, good heavens, but... Well, who do you think... We can't afford to think. We've got to make sure. Yes, of course. Let's see. According to instructions, the money must be left in the side pocket of a car that will be parked at the northeast corner of 47th 3rd Avenue tomorrow night, 9 o'clock. Yes. All right, we'll see to it that the money is there. Yes, but... Say nothing to anyone in your household about bringing us this second letter. All right. Just tell them all that you have decided the best thing to do is to pay off. Perry? Perry? I'm in a hurry, Bev. I've got to see you, Perry. It's very important. What? What's the matter? Step in here in the library. Okay. Well? Oh, Perry, darling. Why did you do it? What are you talking about? I, I know the truth. What? I've known it since yesterday, but I was too shocked to think clearly about it. And I... Look, Bev, what is this? Perry, you wrote that extortion letter, and you, you killed Lou Roberts, too. Now, wait a minute. I tore it off his calendar pad before the FBI got there. Tore what off? I had an appointment with him at 3 o'clock. And he told me he was meeting the extortioner just before then. Carrie, your name was written down for 2.30. Well, 
So what if it was? That he was, was shot three times, Terry. Yeah, I but... I found the pistol in your room. Three bullets have been fired. Okay. Oh, Perry, darling. Never mind, that's tough. Why did you do it? I was in a jam. It's so awful. Ah, so... Cut the crying, will you? Perry, Perry, you've got to give yourself up. Are you kidding? But you'll be found out. Oh, no, I won't. I've already collected the money. The extortion? Call it anything you want. I'm using it to get away in right now. Oh, no, Perry. Let go of me. Oh, but you can't go. I'm warning you, Bev. Let go. No. Okay. Oh, Perry, my arm. You're not going to squeal on me. Please, you're hurting me. I'm going to keep you quiet. Oh, no. No, Perry, please. What? Huh? Oh, it's the FBI. I don't believe your brother is medicine, Miss Cordell. What are you doing here? That extortion money that was left by your mother had fluorescent powder on it. What? We'd like to see how your hands will look under the proper kind of light. In view of the more serious crime of murder, the FBI turned Perry Cortland over to the state. He was later tried and sentenced to be electrocuted. No, not always is the person who commits a crime a criminal in the social sense of the word. Rather, he may be an otherwise acceptable member of society who, in the face of some personal crisis, lacks the moral stamina to resolve it honorably, and instead seeks his way out criminally. Just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's colorful story from the files of your FBI. But now, friends, let me remind you that no matter how much you earn, you have a valuable asset in Social Security. And your Equitable Society representative will gladly show you how easy it is to build your Social Security into full security. He'll explain to you how Social Security and life insurance can work together for your complete protection and will help you determine exactly where you stand under Social Security. No obligation, of course. Phone him tomorrow. Your Equitable Society representative is listed in your local phone book under the name Equitable. E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Death in the Tropics. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now, this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Death in the Tropics. On This is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community.
Are you one of the 50 million Americans covered by Social Security? Well, there may be a pleasant surprise in store for you. In a few minutes, you'll learn from our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, how easy it is to build Social Security into full security. Tonight's FBI file, Death in the Tropics. The familiar adage has it, that the best laid schemes of mice and men oft times go astray. To which we might add, while those of criminals inevitably go astray. One of the most monstrous criminals of all times, Adolf Hitler, was defeated by the inexorable truth of this. And day after day, lesser criminals, such as those in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, are likewise vanquished by it. For the evil schemes of men are as fragile as the minds which create them, and they crush like eggshells against the rock-ribbed eternity of justice. In a rather lavish apartment in midtown Manhattan, a young woman is just admitting a guest. He is one Dan Ogden, junior partner of the firm of Durant and Ogden, specialists in interstate commerce. Hijacking. Come in, Dan. Thanks, Millie. Where's Jack? Inside, getting dressed. Ah. Oh. You want a drink? No, thanks, baby. Well, tonight's the night, huh? Yep. What's the setup? Pretty big job. Uh-huh. Nearly 4,000 cases of bonded whiskey. Hey. Got to knock off four trucks. That's really a tough order. Yeah, we got it all laid out. Everybody knows what they're supposed to do. Shouldn't be any trouble. How much cash will that stuff bring? A real bundle. Oh, that I like. Hey, Millie, where's that Dan? Oh, how are you, Dan? Hello, Jack. I'm glad you stopped by here, kid. I, uh, I got something I want to spring on you and Millie both. What are you looking for, Jack? That big brown envelope. It's I, right there on the table. Oh, oh, yeah. Good, good. There's uh, something in here I want to show you. What is it? Pictures. Huh? Now, uh, sit down, both of you. What is it? Sit down, will you? Okay. Look, Danny, when you and I started in business together, we agreed that if either one of us wanted to pull out sometime, he could. Remember? Yeah. Well, tonight's my last job. What? Are you kidding? I got plenty of letters packed away for me and Millie, and we're going to get out of this larceny business for good. What are you talking about? Here you are, baby. Take a look at this picture. What's this? It's a banana plantation. So? Yep. I bought it a month ago. What do you know from bananas? <laughs> That's your favorite dish, ain't it? <laughs> bananas and cream for breakfast? Yeah, so but... So you got a whole plantation of them to go against. Where is this joint? Puerto Rico. That's in Africa. Look, honey, it's only 1,400 miles from here. It's, it's right under Florida. Any geography would tell you that. It's still Africa. Okay, okay. Anyway, sweetheart, we're leaving on a boat in the morning, and from then on, we're living like dukes and duchesses. How's it sound to you? Well, I... Well, what do you think about it, Dan? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's swell. Sure, sure. And so will you, Millie, when you get to thinking about it. Hmm. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Look at the time. I, I gotta go in case that warehouse where they're loading the trucks... I'll, uh, I'll pick you up here in 30 minutes, Dan. And look, build Millie up on Puerto Rico while I'm gone, will you? Yeah, yeah, okay. See you later. Well, sweetheart? He thinks I'm going to Puerto Rico. He's nuts. Wants you to leave in the morning. Yeah. What are we going to do, Dan? You've got to think of something quick. Does the idea appeal to you? Puerto Rico? Plantation? Living safe and easy? Not without you, and you know it. Okay, baby. Then I've already thought of something. What do you mean? I mean, it was real nice of Jack to buy that plantation. 
for you and me? Huh? He wants to retire? Okay, I'll see to it tonight that he does retire. For keeps. At 2.30 a.m., Ralph Gardner, an assistant to the agent in charge of the New York office of the FBI, received a report that four motor freight trucks carrying 4,000 cases of bonded liquor had been hijacked. It is now a few minutes before 7 a.m. Gardner has just received a report from an agent on the case. Yeah. Well, Rankin, that's three of the empty trucks accounted for anyway. Who was that, Jackson? Yeah. All I can say is, those hijackers sure had this job organized beautifully. Well, even so, they had to work plenty fast, unload those trucks, and then abandon them way out on the number one highway. Funny about that fourth truck. Why hasn't that one shown up? Well, we ought to hear about it soon. Every highway patrol in three states is alerted now. Any clues from the other three trucks? None. You know, this has got all the earmarks of that job over in Pennsylvania two weeks ago. Yeah. Philadelphia office hasn't cracked that case yet either, has it? No, not yet. Could be the same gang. Excuse me. Oh, sure. Gardner speaking. This is the New Jersey State Police, Mr. Gardner. Oh, hello. What's up? One of our motorcycle men just phoned in. He found one of those trucks in a ditch on a back road. Good. That's the last one. Uh, that's, that is, he found what's left of it. Also, the charred body of a man. Huh? The truck had caught fire some way, and the fellow must have been trapped in the cab. Did the officer find any identification at all? Uh, he thought he'd better report this much first. He's gone back to the spot now to wait for you fellas. All right, then if you'll give me the location, Special Agent Rankin will be on his way in a couple of minutes. Well, sweetheart, better take a good long look at that skyline. Maybe the last time we ever see it. It suits me fine, Danny. You know, too bad I didn't get Jack out of our way a long time ago. This is really living. Danny. Hmm? You don't think there's any possible... What? Nothing. I just want everything to be all right for us. Look, baby, let me tell you what happened. No, I don't want to know. I just... But if I tell you, you'll see for yourself. You got nothing to worry about. <laughs> Now, this is the way it went. Georgie Fresno was driving Jack's truck last night, the one he hijacked. I had it fixed with Georgie. Out of town somewhere, he gives Jack a tap with the masher, ditches the truck, and sets fire to it. Oh. What the cops find looks like an accident. But are you sure, Georgie... Georgie's done jobs for me before. He's never missed yet. I sure hope you're right. Look, baby, we uh, better break this up now. Why? You're supposed to be making this trip with your husband, remember? But I told the purser my husband was detained at the last minute on business. We still better be strangers till we hit San Juan. That purser might start thinking something and remember it later. Well, maybe you're right. Happy sailing, sweetheart. I'll see you in San Juan. Sorry, it was so long getting back, Gardner. What'd you find out? For one thing, the truck catching on fire wasn't any accident. What? Huh? The body wasn't charred enough to hide the mark of a blow on the head. Oh. So, there must have been somebody else inside that truck, too. Could you identify the body? Yeah. Signet ring was still on his left little finger. The initials, J.D. And his leather wallet that had dropped out on the floor of the cab had an identification card. Jack Durant. Jack Durant? Yeah. Unless I'm mistaken, he's got a record of... Hey, miles. wait a minute, Rankin. Yeah? Right after you tore out of here, the Philadelphia office called. They got a lead on that Pennsylvania hijacking two weeks ago. Yeah? The same Jack Durant. <laughs> wow. I sent Jackson out to pick up Durant at his apartment. His packed bags were still there, but his wife and her bags were gone. Mm, and then she must have already heard what happened. No, there's more to it than that. What do you mean? Well, apparently they would planned to skip the country after this job last night. Oh, so we made a fast check on all transportation out of New York, and we found out that Durant had booked passage for himself and wife on a boat which sailed for Puerto Rico two hours ago. Uh, yeah, but with Durant dead, his wife probably changed her mind. Mildred Durant sailed anyway. 
Then we'd better radio the ship to keep her in custody. Well, what can we hold her for? We've no evidence that she's mixed up in any crime. I know. No, no, let's try to round up Durant's gang first. And if we find anything against his wife, we can have the San Juan office pick her up. Or better, we can fly down there ourselves and bring her back. Millie? Yeah, honey. You may not know it, baby, but according to our little map here, all these banana trees we've been passing for the last ten minutes belong to us. No kidding. All we need now is cows for cream and you're in clover. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Millie, look. What? Oh, we're driving up to. Look. Oh, damn. That's our house, baby. I always dreamed about having a joint like that. I just can't believe it. <laughs> well, we're pulling up and taking over right now. Oh, it's well. Yeah. Yeah, I guess we got a lot to be thankful to Jack for at that. Oh, please, Dan. I'm sorry, sweetheart. Come on. Give me a hand. Okay. Oh, gee, I can't wait to see inside. Let's hurry, huh? Okay. Open the door quick. Hey, don't need the key. It's not locked. In you go, baby. Hey, what a touch. Gee, wonderful. Real wonderful. Glad you like it, Mel. <laughs> Jack. right, pal. Can't be. No? Well, we thought that is... Our... Sure. I know what you thought. And it's too bad for you. It didn't work out that way. Jack, wait. Jack, so wait long, a minute, Jack. Give me rat. a chance to... Ex Daddy. Welcome to your new home, sweetheart. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's case, which shows how your FBI helps provide national security. Now let's listen in on a conversation about social security between a brand new father named Steve Brownell and his friend, the Equitable Society representative. Boy, that's one husky looking kid. Weighs eight pounds and he looks just like me. Here, have a cigar. Thanks. Say, your wife doing all right? Just fine, Carl, just fine. Well, Steve, since my business is representing the Equitable Society, I ought to tell you that you now have the equivalent of $9,500 more life insurance than you had yesterday. And it hasn't cost you one red cent extra. Huh? $9,500 more insurance? How come? Well, it's from your old Uncle Sam. Your benefits under Social Security go up now that there's three in your family. Having this baby gives you about $9,500 of extra insurance protection through Social Security. Say, I never knew Social Security was worth all that money to me. Yes, Steve, many Americans don't realize what a wonderful asset they have in Social Security. They've never discovered how easy it is to build Social Security into full security through life insurance with the Equitable Society. For instance, if you already own some life insurance, your Equitable Society man may be able to show you how only a few dollars extra per month will give your family complete protection through the Equitable Extended Income Plan. Remember, your Social Security benefits vary according to your age, salary, and family situation. Why not get the facts? Find out exactly what you're entitled to under Social Security. The government has prepared a special card that will help you secure this information. To obtain one of these cards, get in touch with your Equitable Society representative or send your name and address on a postcard to the Equitable Society, care of this station. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E, -E, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States.
And now back to the FBI file, Death in the Tropics. Yes, the evil schemes of men are as fragile as the minds which create them. And they crush like eggshells against the rock-ribbed eternity of justice. Well, thus far in tonight's case, the criminal plot of one man, Dan Ogden, has been shattered by the spouting gun of the man he schemed against, the gangster hijacker Durant. As for Durant's plan to flee justice himself, well, other events bearing on that are already in motion. Shortly after Dan Ogden walked into his death at the plantation cottage, FBI agents Gardner and Rankin from New York landed at the Isla Grande airport on San Juan and proceeded to the local office of the FBI. At this moment, Gardner has about finished bringing San Juan agent in charge, Houston, up to date on the case. So it seems pretty conclusive that the man slugged and burned in a truck was Jack Durant, all right. And you think his wife might be mixed up in it? Well, we don't know that, Houston, but we've got good reason to believe that she didn't make the trip here alone. And how's that? We checked the passenger list again in New York just before catching a plane, and we ran into the name of one of Durant's gang, Dan Ogden. Oh, there could have been a romance there between Ogden and Durant's wife. And Ogden got Durant out of the way. He could have. Have you uncovered anything yet? No. When I got your cable this morning, I started a man investigating to see if Durant had bought any property on the island. But so far, nothing's turned up. Uh. This may be my man now. He's been over at the Hall of Records for the last two hours. Houston speaking. I think I found what you want, Houston. Yeah? What is it? Well, a real estate broker acting for a man in New York named Durant bought a banana plantation about a month ago. Well, get the location of the place quick, Fred. And then get back over here and drive Gardner and Rankin out there. Now, look, Jack, you gotta believe me. I didn't have anything to do with it. Stop lying. Everybody. But I tell you... Stop lying, I said. I got a right to tell my side of it. I already know it. Okay, then, if you're satisfied with what you think you know, kill me. Go ahead. All right. Let's hear your story. This is the truth, so help me. Go on. Well, when you didn't come back from that job, by the time morning came, I was scared stiff. Yeah? Yeah. Then Dan come to the apartment, all in the lather, and said something had gone wrong. And you worked plenty hot with the cops right then. You said a fact. Yeah. And he said that you told him to get me on the boat and to come on down here with me to uh, look after me until you had cooled off and could make it here yourself. No kidding. Honest, I didn't want to go off and leave you, but if you thought it was best, there wasn't anything else for me to... Jack, it's the truth, every word I'm saying. Don't you believe me? Georgie Fresno got cold feet about knocking me off, Mill, and told me the whole story. I don't care what Georgie Fresno told... I do. Told... Just the way it turned out. You and Danny done me a big favor. What do you mean? As far as the cops are concerned, Jack Durant is a dead man. What? I did to Georgie Fresno what he was supposed to do to me. Then I fixed it so the cops would think he was me. But... Then I grabbed a plane and come on down here to be on hand to greet you and Danny. When you arrive to set up housekeeping. Listen, Shut Jack. up. Since you and Danny have done me such a big favor, now I'm going to do you one. I'm going to let you go ahead and keep house with Danny. Only I might have a little trouble explaining to the cops why he has to lie down all the time. You know, I couldn't have been the cause of it. Remember? I'm dead. Jack, come back, you can't... So long, sucker. And enjoy the bananas. <laughs> Jack! 
back. I knew you'd come. I beg your pardon. Are you Mildred Durant? Well, who are you? We're a special agent of the FBI. FBI? That's right. Well, wh what do you want here? I mean, what, what have you... Oh, all right. You might as well come on in. Thank you. Go ahead, Ransom. Thanks. Now, the reason we're here, Mrs. Durant... Gardner. Is... Yeah. Over there on the floor. Is that Ogden? Yeah. Take a look at him, Rankin. You don't have to, he said. But I didn't do it. Who did? Well, I don't suppose you'll believe me when I tell you. But he did it anyway, and he's right here on this island now, Just no matter what... Just a you... minute, Mrs. Durant. Who are you talking about? My husband. Your husband? <laughs> don't give us that. Wait a minute, Ransom. Told you you wouldn't believe me. Well, under the circumstances, it's rather difficult, since our records at the moment show that your husband is dead. I know the truth about that, too, but you'll believe what you we like. We believe so... only what we know to be a fact, Mrs. Durant. I'm telling you a fact. My husband, Jack Durant, killed Dan Ogden. He was here in this house not more than 30 minutes before you got here. I better take that, Ranky. Hello. This is Houston. That you, Gardner? Yes, what's wrong? Just got a radiogram from your office in New York. Yeah? That body has been identified positively now, and it's not Durant. What? It's the body of one of his men, Georgie Fresno. We'll be in in a few minutes. Thanks. Right. Mrs. Durant. Hmm? If your husband is not dead, whose body was it that was found burned in the truck? Georgie Fresno. Rankin, I believe she's telling us the truth. Huh? And I believe your husband is on the island, too, Mrs. Durant. You come with us, and we better hurry. Looks like a storm coming up. Charter a plane to Cuba. For when? When do you think? Now. <laughs> Are you kidding? What do you mean? You ought to know. You're soaking with it. What's the matter? You're scared of a little rain, are you? It's not the rain, mister. It's the storm that's going on with okay, it. Okay, so that raises the price. I'll pay it. I got to get to Cuba now. I'll take you to Cuba and at the regular charter rate. But not until the weather clears. Understand? Now, look here. You can't... There's no argument about it. Take it or leave it. Uh, when do you think it'll clear? Please. Don't last long down here. Maybe an hour or two. Okay, okay. Got your identification to get into Cuba? I've been to Cuba before. Okay. But I have to have your name, too. Uh, Fresno. George Fresno. Okay. Take it easy. I'll holler when it's time to take off. Of him, Houston? We've checked every hotel in San Juan and all the airlines and steamship offices. Not booked, huh? No. So he's probably trying to go under somewhere on the island. Got the police alerted? Yeah. You can charter a plane out of here, can't you? Well, we checked the only two charter services. Durant's not booked with them either. Well, at the moment, it looks as if Mr. Jack Durant might as well be dead as far... Hey, wait a minute. Hold on. Yeah? I got an idea. I think that we might... Fresno. Mr. Fresno. Yeah? You can board the plane now if you want to. Uh, about time. We, uh, we won't be taken off right away, though. What? How okay. can... Well, you might call it a situation over which I have no control. What do you mean? I, I... He means us, Durant. What? Who are you? Special agents of the FBI. Oh, well, I didn't expect you... Put on that gun, Durant. You're staying where you are until we take off or out here. 
All right, take his gun, Rankin. Right. Now, you get up, Durant. We should have spotted you sooner. In fact, we should have known all along you'd be using the name of George Fresno. Jack Durant was tried for the murders of George Fresno and Dan Ogden and sentenced to the electric chair. Information which the FBI got from Durant before the trial led to the arrest and conviction of all other members of the hijacking gang. Durant's wife was released as no criminal charge could be brought against her. Yes, the familiar adage has it that the best laid schemes of mice and men oft times go astray. To which we add again, while those of criminals inevitably go astray. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's colorful story from the files of your FBI. And now, friends, let me remind you that no matter how much you earn, you have a valuable asset in Social Security. And your Equitable Society representative will gladly show you how easy it is to build your Social Security into full security. He'll explain to you how Social Security and life insurance can work together for your complete protection and will help you determine exactly where you stand under Social Security. No obligation, of course. Phone him tomorrow. Your Equitable Society representative is listed in your local phone book under the name Equitable. E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the walkie-talkie stick-ups. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlson. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. And now, this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The walkie-talkie stick-ups. On this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.